aging. What the fuck, guys? Oh, this sucks. <laughs> but like thinking about my parents getting older. Ah! <laughs> it's not funny. <laughs> What's up, you guys, and welcome back to Emotionally Online, the weekly slumber party for spilling guts and sharing secrets, hosted by yours truly, the one and only Maddie Drossback, who is ready to gulp down this glass of wine after the week that I've had. I'm just kidding. I'm being dramatic. Being dramatic for no reason. I've actually had kind of a good week. I'm just exhausted, and it's Friday, and I'm ready to crack open this bottle of wine, drink myself a little Pinot Grige, gab with the girls and then i'm gonna make myself some pasta and watch a movie it's a good day it's a good day to have a fucking good day people okay also lady gaga released new music today harlequin it was mostly covers it's a very theatrical album companion album to the joker which comes out next week i am so excited have my tickets to see it opening night obviously fucking obviously and let me just say right now as a preface point that this could be the worst movie I've ever seen in my entire life. And I will still give it at minimum of four stars. <laughs> and that's because Lady Gaga's in it. And so therefore at minimum, even at its worst, it is better than some of the best. And that's something I live by. That's something that I feel in my bones to be true. If Lady Gaga's on screen, it's good. I'm happy. I'm entertained. I'm enjoying myself. This is something I live by and that won't be changing anytime soon. So listen, I've been reading the reviews. I think I gave the first Joker movie a three stars. This one's getting higher. This one blowing it out of the water. Sequel better than the original? Yes. When Lady Gaga's in it, absolutely. And I just, here's my thing. Harlequin, this album that Gaga put out today, which is just like such a treat knowing that the first single of LG7 comes out next month in October. Album slated for February. Ugh! Listen, 2025 is going to be so good. I can already feel it. But this being like a little treat to hold us over until we get the lead single of LG7. I just, I love it. I love when Lady Gaga has fun. I just love Lady Gaga. I love anything that she does. I think she's a brilliant person. I love when she just lets herself be creative and lean into and fully immerse herself in whatever project she's working on at the minute. Like this is a companion album to a movie she was working on because she was just so in it and so immersed letting her creative self run wild. I love it. I love how she is so committed to the art and the craft above all else. She doesn't care that her fans aren't living, breathing, and dying for a musical theater album the same way she doesn't really care that her fans didn't want a jazz album. She doesn't give a shit. She's here for the art. She's here to make what inspires her to live her best, most authentic, creative life. And I love it. She inspires the fuck out of me. I support everything that Lady Gaga does in this lifetime. Even when she's a part of shitty movies, it doesn't matter to me. I gave House of Gucci a four and a half stars. <laughs> Jared Leto effectively made Waluigi in that movie. There's no way it was a four and a half stars if Lady Gaga wasn't in it, but she was. So it was a four and a half stars. Listen, I wish someone rode for me the way I ride for Lady Gaga. <laughs> so anyways, Harlequin came out. It's fun. It's musical theater. It's mostly covers. I had a good time listening to it this morning while I did my little chores, got the girls breakfast, and um, I'm excited to see Joker next week. I'm going to be in that theater, head to toe and Gaga merch, ready to whoop it up with every other little monster in that theater. <laughs> I hope that theater is full of gays. It would be so much more fun. Uh, uh, I've been going back and listening to a lot of Chromatica recently just to amp myself up for LG7, remembering how much I love Enigma, how truly and deeply underrated I feel Enigma is as a song, and also how profound Stupid Love is when you listen to it through the lens of believing it's a self-love anthem. When I listen to Stupid Love, every time I'm having a bad day, and I'm just feeling like down on myself and I need like a little reminder from, um, I don't know, like my higher self. I listen to Stupid Love and I imagine it is me looking at myself being like, you're the one that I've been waiting for. 
I waited my whole life to become the woman that you are today. Got to quit this crying. Nobody's going to heal me if I don't open the door. Kind of hard to believe. Got to have faith in me. Freak out, freak out, freak out, freak out. And you're like, ah, it's all crazy. And I'm doubting myself. And I'm feeling all these negative things. And it's so hard. And But I need you. You're the one that I've been waiting for. I want your stupid love, you fucking idiot. Get it together. I love you. Love me back. Talking you to yourself. Ugh. It heals everything in me. Every time I listen to stupid love and imagine it's me yelling at myself to like get it together because I am the woman I always wanted to be and you're here right now and I want to be loved by you. So get it the fuck together. I just, it hits so much harder than thinking that it's a love song. Stupid love is a self-love anthem. Stupid love is a self-love anthem. I don't care what Gaga has said or hasn't said. Doesn't matter to me. Stupid love is a self-love anthem. To me, that's what it is. And it's been so good re-listening to that. And it's been so good having these songs more in my rotation. Also, I've been very into the dare. Um, Coming off of Charlie's album, yes. But also, I took a dance class two weeks ago. And uh, we danced to Good Time by the dare. And I was fucking obsessed. It was so fun. I feel like I had such a good time in the dance class. And now I've been listening to it on repeat. I'm excited for um spotify wraps to come out i'm interested to see what my wrapped is gonna look like von dutch is absolutely my most listened to song of the year that's the only thing i know for sure (laughs) another thing i've been consuming recently or i don't know if you can say i've been consuming this more so that i consumed all of it in one day in one clean swoop secret lives of mormon wives which I didn't expect to consume. I wasn't planning on consuming it. It just sort of happened. I was sitting on this couch and I was sewing patches onto my Lads on Tour bag that I made, Um, showed it in a recent vlog of mine. And I just needed something on in the background. I needed some background noise. So, you know, I'd seen people talking about it, threw it on and I didn't realize how long it was going to take me to sew the patches on. And so all of a sudden I'm like, you know, halfway through sewing the patches on and I'm four episodes in and there's eight episodes in the season. I'm like, well, I'm just committing to watching all of this now. Like we're just in it. So I did. I watched the whole season in a day. Those women are crazy. Here are my reflections. (laughs) Number one, that show made me want to drink soda more than anything else has ever made me want to drink soda. Soda! Like (laughs) i I left watching that show so pissed that there's not like soda shops around New York. I mean, I suppose almost anywhere can be a soda shop if you want it to be. Like you can get sodas, but it's different when it's like a curated soda shop, you know? They get all these gross syrups just absolutely demolishing the sanctity of a Diet Coke. Like I, that's fun to me. And so, you know what? I was slamming Diet Cokes while I was watching that show. Not good. I had so much caffeine that day, but it was so fun and I enjoyed myself. And also it is so crazy to me the way that some people live <laughs> like the same way when I watch Love Island and I'm like, wow, you guys are crazy and I love you and I have nothing in common with you and I just love you so much. That's how I felt watching Secret Lives of Mormon Wives. I'm like, you guys are bonkers and I love you. Oh my goodness. When I realized that one of the bitches on Secret Lives of Mormon Wives was the same girl that did that TikTok dance in front of her infant that was in the hospital, I remember seeing that on TikTok so long ago and when I saw it in the show, I was like, that was you. It was you. Oh, it was so fun. It was worlds colliding. It was like, I giggled about you in bed one night as I'm scrolling through the internet, absolutely blasting the shit out of you for doing a TikTok dance while your infant's in the hospital. And now I'm watching you on Hulu do more silly shit. I love it. I love it. I love reality TV. I can't help but love it. It's so ridiculous and stupid. I can't consume too much of it because I just think that Um, there are better things for my brain to consume and listen I could spend all my time consuming reality tv if I felt that that is what I needed to do I already spend so much of my life consuming reality tv we really don't need more I've got to hit my movie watching goals come on now almost at 200 movies this year got to keep that going can't be watching too much reality tv 
but wow, Secret Lives of Mormon Wives just made me um, excited again about reality TV. Particular, I mean, I won't spoil it, but like the relationships that they have on that show, particularly all the stuff that happened when they were in Vegas, if you know, you know, like sometimes reality TV is so good because it makes you so happy that you're single. Like I watch shit like that and I'm like, oh guys, this is just delicious. <laughs> this is just fucking delicious. And I love, I love that this isn't me and that I don't relate. And it, isn't that so awesome that we don't relate? <laughs> you know, like we hear so much about relatable content and everyone wants to relate to people. I actually feel the exact opposite. I want to consume content from people that I do not relate to at all so that I can sit back and feel more grateful for my own life. Right. It's like a reverse thing. Like I watch someone else's life that I really don't want. And I feel like, oh, thank God. Oh, thank God. I am not married to a man that's going to verbally harass me for accidentally stepping foot into a Chippendales. <laughs> That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy, guys. Wow. What a time to be alive, though. I had a good time. Wow. 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 <laughs> One thing I've been talking about a lot in therapy is like this era of life that I'm in right now that I fear is just uh, a product of your late 20s. But it's been an era full of really realizing um, what it means to choose a different path, a different life path than a lot of the people that you love and um, how that feels and how that will feel as I get older and it becomes more, I guess, stark the differences in path between the one that I'm choosing and the ones being chosen by people close to me. Um, I have always known that I am choosing to live a life that is different than a lot of the people I am close to that I grew up with than the family I was raised in. I have known that yet I haven't really felt like I had to live through um feeling how different it is until more recently or maybe that I am about to know what that feels like and I feel like I'm preemptively starting to feel nervous about it uh, in one way or the other one of my uh childhood friends is getting married in two weeks and she is the first one of my friends to get married. Obviously, I've been to weddings before of my cousins and family friends, you know, people much older than me. I've, I've never had someone, um, one of my friends from childhood that I've known for so much of my life, same age as me, get married until now. And I'm so excited. It is like, I don't know. I'm so excited to see one of my friends get married, to see one of my friends uh, in love, to get to celebrate one of my longest friendships, um, finding someone they want to spend the rest of their life with. That's going to be such an incredible weekend. And I'm so excited for that coming up here. Um, but it is a moment where you're like, whoa, like my friends are getting married. Like people are life is moving. We're getting older. That's crazy. It was like, I, I, I've had moments where I've been like, damn, I have multiple friends that are engaged. People are getting married. I hear people talk about, you know, buying homes, talking, you know, planning for having children, where they want to raise kids, all of that. I hear people talk about this stuff and I'm like, whoa, that's crazy. That is so crazy. Cause my life looks nothing like that. <laughs> and it won't look like that. I moved to New York for college in 2015. And when I moved to New York, I never came back. I wasn't someone that like came home for summers uh, during college. I stayed in New York. The only summer that I came home was the first summer after my freshman year. And even then I was going back and forth all summer. I was not um, staying in one place. I moved to New York and I decided I never wanted to leave. I knew that I loved New York and that I wanted to live here forever, even before I moved to New York. But then I moved here and I was like, oh, wow, I never want to leave. I never, ever want to leave. Nine years later, I still feel that way. I love New York. I never want to leave. This is where I want to spend the rest of my life. And that's that. I've made up my mind. Nobody can change it. 
I love this city. I want to be here forever. And um, in that way, I think it was also different transitioning from college to postgrad because I lived in the same city that I had lived in for four years already. Transitioning from college to postgrad for a lot of people is a big transition because you're moving out of your college town into a brand new place, you know, starting a full time job building a new community for yourself where for me that transition was essentially seamless my life senior year and first year postgrad was essentially identical but I think even living in New York it's highlighted the differences between people who want to live in New York that see living here as being like a long-term commitment you're committing yourself to your community to your city you see yourself here for a you know long time there's a difference between people that see living here like that and people that are just passing through and you know want to live here for an era to say they lived in New York and otherwise they don't see themselves here they don't want to get married here they don't want to have kids here they don't want to be here you know when they get old um it's just like a fun for now sort of thing which I have never related to. Every time I hear people be like, New York's just getting old. I'm just, I'm, I just don't have the energy anymore. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about, but like love they're getting closer to what you need to do for you, bestie. But like, <laughs> I love New York so much. I think it's the best city on earth. I, yeah, I'll fight anyone on that. I really don't give a shit. <laughs> but <laughs> this came up for the first time a couple weeks ago where I, I don't know why I texted this. But I just was like, I don't know, I have moments where I'm just like hit with a wave of like, oh, and I love the besties and I would literally do anything for the besties. And at the end of the day, if it's anything or the besties, I'm picking the besties. And I have moments where I'm just like, I need to tell my friends I fucking love them. So naturally, I opened up my group chat with Ashley, my childhood best friend, Ellie, my college best friend, and Mika, who is... Ashley's college best friend that I stole and she's now one of my best friends and then Ellie is now one of Ashley's best friends and then we introduced Ellie and Mika last summer and it's just you know big best friend swap that happened I texted in the group chat that I have with those three and I was like I need you guys to know that I love you so much that I want to know you in every era of your lives that I want to be involved in every chapter. And I'm so excited to see you guys get married. If you, if, and when you choose to have children, I want you to know that I want to be so fucking involved in those kids lives. (laughs) I was like, listen guys, I know we're not there yet. And I don't even know what, you know, how life is going to shake out for each of us. But just so you guys know when, and if a baby comes into the picture, like I am going to be the most fucking involved onto the face of the planet. I love you guys with every part of me. Okay. These three women mean so much to me. I actually cannot verbalize it to you. And right now all three of them live in Boston and sometimes that sucks. Sometimes it sucks that I am the only one that is not in the same place as like three people that mean so much to me, three people that I would drop anything to hang out with, three people that I would love to split a bottle of wine with right now. Sometimes it sucks that I don't live in the same city as any of them. And I think sometimes people's immediate reaction to hearing something like that is like, well, just move closer to your friends. And, um, I hear it. Also, that's not an option for me because I love New York and I'm supposed to be here and this is where I want to live. This is where I see myself. This is what I'm choosing for me. And it just, it sucks that my friends aren't also here. And that's just like a suckage that I've had to accept because it is part of the life I am choosing for myself. You know, like I I don't want to live in Boston. (laughs) So that's why I won't move there. Um, despite the fact that my friends live there, my family lives in Maine. So it's closer to Maine. Uh, one of my brothers lives in Boston. I don't want to live in Boston. I want to live in New York. I love New York. This is where I'm going to be. But yeah, it does suck that I live far from a lot of my best friends and, you know, my family's close, but, um, you know, they're not an hour away. I can't, just go drive to see them without it being a whole to do. And when I sent that text in the group, Ashley, you guys know Ashley, fucking obviously, best woman on earth, famously said that. Ashley was like so touched by that. And we had like a great conversation about like what the future of our friendship would look like when 
children are in the picture if and when that happens. And honestly, it's something that I've reflected on a lot very recently in life because I have been so aware that like I am choosing to live a life that is different than the people that I love. And there is going to be a time in the near future (laughs) because I'm seeing these changes start to happen where it's going to feel more evident that there's going to be more of a clear difference between me and the people that I'm closest to. And it's almost like I'm trying to preemptively prepare myself for when those changes happen. And in my head, I've been like, you know, I don't want distance to ever be the reason why I'm not close friends with someone. That's why I have put in so much time to maintaining my long distance friendships. And then it's like, well, I don't want children to change that. I don't want like changes in our priorities in life to change that. When my friends have fucking kids, my priorities change too. Those kids are now my priority as well. Like same thing when my siblings have kids. Like I know that I don't see myself having kids. And again, I say this and I'm not saying that there's no world where I would have kids. I just can't picture it. When I picture my future, I picture myself falling in love with someone, living in New York and just being in love and traveling and living a creative life with this one person that I'm in love with. That's what I envision for myself. (laughs) I envision a life that is like very free and just like creative and whimsical and fun and romantic. That's what I want. I don't see myself having children, but who knows? Who literally knows? I don't know who I'm going to end up with, where I'm going to end up. If I ended up in a relationship where we wanted to, and that made sense for us, I wouldn't like say no because I'm committed to not having children. That's not what it is to me. I just don't foresee it happening. But I know that I'm close with so many people that do want kids. And obviously this is something that people have managed in the past. There are other people that have chosen not to have children that have maintained close relationships with friends of theirs that have chosen to have kids and go on a different path. Obviously it works out. People, you know, learn and grow and you move and you figure out, you know, what your friendships look like in this new era. But this really is something that I've been thinking about a lot. Thought about it in the context of friends. I've thought about it in the context of family. I was talking to my dad on the phone about this uh, last week because I was like, I'd, I'd be lying if I didn't say that sometimes I didn't have this fear of being forgotten that like someday everybody I love's lives were going to be, I don't know, full of a new life that I wasn't a part of, that people are going to get married and have kids and build their own families. And then there's going to be a day where I am like not in anybody's family picture. Does that make sense? Like, I don't want to (laughs) cry. But like, I, I'm like so family oriented. Oh, (laughs) but I am someone who really cares about family and family has meant a lot to me my whole life. And I'm so sentimental and emotional about things like And there are some things I didn't realize were over until they were over. Like I'm the oldest child. And when I moved away for college, I was so excited to go to college and just live in New York and do my thing. And I didn't realize at that time that like, wow, this is the end of the time in life where I get to live with my siblings, where we get to live under the same roof and see each other every single day. I was so excited to go to college that I didn't even realize that it was ending until it was over. Then I feel like I had a lot of moments. Oh God. (laughs) Fully crying on the podcast. (laughs) I feel like I had a lot of moments in college and after where I've been like, damn, that's really sad. (laughs) That's really sad that there will never be a time again in life where my sister is one door over. (laughs) And, you know, I don't know, there's something like endearing about fighting with your brother about who gets the, you know, first video game controller. (laughs) And there was a part of me that I was so excited about this next chapter of my life that I didn't realize that there was a big chapter ending in like my family life. And when you're the first one out, you miss out on a lot because your siblings are still young. And so I missed out. 
on a lot of my siblings' childhood. And obviously I had to, you know, like I had to go to college. I had to go to this next chapter of my life. I had to keep living and like go on my own life path. But I'd be lying if I said it wasn't hard sometimes because I, I wanted to be there and like be so involved in their lives. (laughs) But it's like that. We just can't do that. I can't put my life on pause to stay at home an extra eight years so I can watch my youngest brother graduate high school like I have to go off and do my own thing and live my own life and I will do everything in my power to maintain relationships with my siblings and my family and I've done a damn good job of it I'm very close with my whole family but it's just like uh it's so emotional the changes and like you don't even realize that it's happening until all of a sudden it is happening and I feel like the youngest sibling gets like um a slower ease into that change because they're the last one to go. So you see every sibling that's older than you leave and there's like a little tiny incremental change that happens until you go. And in my head, that probably makes it easier, but in some ways maybe it's worse because it's a slower ripping of the bandaid. I don't know. But to me, it was like all in one go. And then I was somewhere else and my whole family was at home and I was missing out on that. And, um, I don't know. It's like as I'm getting older and I'm entering my late 20s and I'm seeing people enter this next chapter of their lives. Sometimes I worry about like if there comes a day. And I don't know. I guess I I just start thinking too far in the future and I don't know what life is going to look like, you know. (laughs) And um, I, I just... It's hard feeling untethered or like you don't have an anchor. I am my own anchor (laughs) and I am a great fucking anchor, (laughs) but sometimes it is hard to be choosing to live a life that you don't have anybody on the same path as you yet. I'm 27, I'm young, like I have time to find people that have the exact same vision for life or the future that I do and like I will make new friends in every chapter of my life. Community ebbs and flows and changes and we all go on different paths, whatever, it's just like hard, (laughs) it's hard to like see it all happening. But it's hard for me to not sometimes be in my head like, damn, is there going to be a day where everyone I know and love has families of their own and I'm just like an accessory in everyone's lives and I'm not necessarily like a central person that somebody is tethered to and that scares me I think that uh, that does really scare me (laughs) and it sometimes it feels like marriage and children is the only way to like guarantee that right but even then it's not guaranteed but in my head it's like okay well marriage and children that's how you guarantee that you always have like people tethered to you and that you always have you know people that their lives are intertwined with yours in such a serious way versus like you know you having your own separate lives that maybe occasionally overlap and intersect for the most part you're completely on your own and I feel like that's why I feel like I I want to make clear to my friends now that I'm like I want to be involved in your lives in every fucking chapter. (laughs) And like when you have kids and when your life looks different than mine, I want to be there for that too. I want to be in your lives forever. I want to be important figures in your children's lives. Like I will drop everything for you guys and I need you to fucking know that. (laughs) And I think I'm feeling the need to reiterate that to the people I love now because I'm like, oh my God, there's so many things that are changing. (laughs) people are getting married. I have friends that are talking about moving out of New York to like figure out where they want to settle down when they do have kids. Like that's crazy. I'm just on a completely (laughs) different life path, schedule, timeline, goal, all of it. I do not fucking relate. It's just crazy getting older and like it's harder to avoid seeing. Wow. Okay this is different. I have chosen to do something different. 
<laughs> and I knew that I was, but I maybe didn't know that I was until now I'm getting older and I'm like, holy shit, whoa. And now I'm nervous and now I'm worried. And I know I don't have to be worried. And I know that like all of my friends that I've talked to, even when I talk to my dad about it, everyone's like, Maddie, what are you talking about? <laughs> They're like, you are way too ahead of yourself. You're living way too far in the future, girl. Like for one, you don't know what the future is going to be like, or, or like, I don't know who you're going to have be in community with 20, 30 years from now. And like how similar to you, their lives are going to be. You don't know, you know, what relationship you're going to be in or what that's going to look like, how tethered you are to another person in that way. Like, there's so much you don't know about the future. I have just felt worried. I've just felt scared, I think, thinking about the future and about how I think I have maybe chosen a life that is at risk for loneliness. <laughs> and the thing is, is I actually wouldn't change a single thing. I feel so confident and like happy in the life that I've chosen for myself. And there are things that I wish for and I long for like, you know, living closer to my friends and family and who knows how that'll change. You know, when we get like older, older, I can't even think about that. That makes me want to <laughs> like thinking about my parents getting old. Oh, I can't think about it. I'm going to cry again. <laughs> oh my God. Aging. What the fuck, guys? Oh, this sucks. <laughs> but like thinking about my parents getting older. Ah! <laughs> It's not funny. <laughs> but I think about that and I'm like, oh my God. Would I feel so devastated and so sad not living near my parents as they're getting older, not living near my siblings and my best friends when they have kids? Like, <sighs> it just sucks. I can't even think about it. Because it makes me so sad. It makes me so unexplainably sad. I actually cannot think about it. I know what I want for me, for my life. I love New York. I love living here. I want to live here forever. I think maybe it's just hard for me right now because I do feel so untethered. And so like I am my own anchor. And I do really long to be tethered to someone else. To have someone to be so intertwined with. And I think the lack of that during a transitional period in life where I'm seeing other people branch off and really like feeling the differences in our life paths. I think I, I become more aware of the fact that I am very untethered. Like my life is surrounded by people that love me, that I love them, but it's like what happens when all those people are tethered to other people and they start whole new lives together and like Am I a part of those lives? Of course you are. Of course you are. Of course you are. Of course you are. <laughs> I don't know. You know what I'm saying? It's just like life changes. Life changes and you get older and um, suddenly you're like, you know, crying in the group chat, telling your friends that um, whenever they have kids, <laughs> You're going to figure out a way to make it work, baby. <laughs> I'm taking that Amtrak up once a week. <laughs> you need a babysitter? You just let me know. I don't care that I don't live in your city. I will find a way to make it work. Okay? Your kid's acting up. You call You call me. You put me on FaceTime with that motherfucker. I'll give him a word or two. All right? <laughs> you need a break from parenting? Just call me up. Call me up and I'm there. Okay? I want to be involved in these fucking kids' lives, these unborn children's lives that I'm making up inside my head. <laughs> it is crazy, though, and it is um, a strange and beautiful and yet painful thing 
knowing what you want for yourself so certainly and also having that be in contrast to what the people that you love the most want for their own lives. It is hard um, being so self-certain and also being certain of a life that is different um, than the people that you are closest to. And I miss my family and I miss my best friends that don't live in New York. And, um, you know, I wish my sister didn't live all the way across the country in L.A. Because I miss her more than most things in life. (laughs) Same with my brother who also lives in L.A. It is, um, it sucks not to see them every day. I cannot talk about this again because I will cry for another time. (laughs) But I do miss when I got to see those people every day. I undervalued how cool it was to get to hang out with my siblings every day. To drive to the dance studio with my sister after school every day. To see my grandma and my mom and my dad. To spend Sundays at my grandparents' house every Sunday night. I didn't realize how much I would miss those things (laughs) later on. You know? And I think that's why I tried to build rituals now in my life (laughs) with like trivia and things like that because I just miss um, feeling anchored to something to people oh god oh anyways (laughs) I open a bottle of wine for once (laughs) in like fucking Five months and I'm sobbing on the podcast about getting older. (laughs) Banned from drinking on Emotionally Online from now on. (laughs) I'm going to be sniffling throughout the rest of this episode. Jeez. Let's get into these audience submissions, shall we? There's um, a lot of good stuff in the box right now. So let's dive in before I pour myself a second glass of wine. (laughs) Hi, Maddie. I've been a podcast listener for a while and look up to you so much. You are like my internet big sister and I have so much admiration for you. Thank you for being the CEO of Lover Girls Worldwide. Truly, no one can do it like you. Thank you. Shout out to my internet little sister, whoever you are out there. (laughs) Two of my closest friends and I are like a little trio. We have a group chat, hang out a lot, and even took a vacation together over the summer. I love them both very much and love the closeness and tight knitedness of our little group. There is one thing that does really bother me, though. The way that they sometimes joke with each other. For reference, I am plus size and they are straight size. With the resurgence of the term fatty being brought back into everyday vocabulary. Is this a TikTok thing? Because I don't know that I knew that. Outside of like the Demi Lovato delete it fat jokes. Is fatty a word that people use now? I have not seen or heard that. I'm feeling a bit old right now. (laughs) Fuck. (laughs) They have been using this term to joke with each other in front of me. They would say it to each other as a joke and grab at each other's stomachs and even pay attention to the amount that the other will eat and comment on it by calling them fatty. Whoa, what? They do not joke this way with me at all or say any of those things to me, but they have no problem doing it in front of me. Wait, how is it a joke though? That seems really mean. I don't really know what to say, so I've just said nothing. I just don't know exactly what to say and fear that they will just say that I'm insecure about my weight or something, which I don't think that they would do, but I'm really just not sure about how to confront them about this. Again, this is something that doesn't happen every time we see each other, but rest assured if eating something is involved, it definitely will happen. One-on-one, this doesn't even come up just when they're together. Just wondering what insights you may have on this. I love you so much and I'm so grateful for your podcast. Whoa. Okay, whoa. I was being so genuine. I didn't realize that people were actually back to using the word fatty with their friends as a like a weird negative dig thing. That's bizarre. I haven't heard that in so many years. How weird. How weird. This is a reminder 
to everyone. Let me just use this quick plug for my belief system real quick. (laughs) Fat is not a bad word. It's just a neutral descriptor. Um, however, obviously people do use this word in a negative way. They say it in a negative tone. They say it as a bad thing. And that is not right. I think the usage of the word fat as an accurate descriptor is totally fine. I refer to myself as a fat woman. If you were having a conversation about me to another person, you can call me a fat woman or a plus size woman. Both things, uh, are fine. Both things are accurate ways to identify me. That would not be offensive to me in any way. It is simply a neutral descriptor. That said, you know when someone is using the word fat in a negative way. The word fatty is kind of hard for it to ever be not a little negative. Like if you went around like, oh, I watched this YouTuber, Maddie Drosbeck, a fatty. It'd be like, okay, (laughs) that feels a little aggressive (laughs) versus being like, oh, I watched this plus size YouTuber, this fat woman on YouTube, Maddie Drosbeck, which maybe it's a little weird to even lead with that like physical qualifier. But if you were telling like another fat person, like, oh, there's this fat YouTuber that I watched because then it would be, there would be some sort of reason you were telling people that I was fat because my body image had something to do with why you were recommending me. Anyways, (laughs) not at all what I was talking about. interesting that we're just throwing everything to the wind not necessarily surprising because as we've talked about many times on this podcast the like state of body image and fat phobia in the world right now is really not looking good um and yeah it makes sense to me as we're seeing the resurgence of more and more like shitty body image language and takes from the early 2000s we're seeing uh the resurgence of something like this as well where people are just cool with calling thin people fatty in front of fat people and pinching at their stomachs and making fun of themselves or their friends um, for being fatties while their plus size friend stands there and watches them. Yeah, I mean... We all lived through that at one point in our lives. It just is crazy that it's happening in 2024. So let me just affirm to you right at the gates here that that is completely unacceptable. And you have every right to be uncomfortable by that and to be upset by that. It is objectively very weird and tone deaf. I have never understood this. Like every time someone did this, every time a thin person would like use the word fat in a negative way in front of me, every time that's ever happened to me in my life, I've always been like, I feel like I'm in a time warp. Like, I feel like I've entered a black hole, uh, uh, this like space in time where nothing makes sense. And I'm just here floating above myself. Like every time that ever happened to me, I was always like, you think I'm the right audience for that? Like, sorry, you think that you as a thin person, you as a thin person are looking at me who is very obviously several sizes bigger than you. You're going to look at me and call yourself fat as a mean negative word. Okay. So did we not think for one second how that was going to hit? Like, did we not consider the audience for this? It's just like, I don't know. It perplexed me every time it happened because I was always like, Are we really not thinking about anyone besides ourselves? I know the answer, but I need you to say it. (laughs) We just need to do some thinking about the audiences that we say things in front of and what our words mean. I just need people to have a little bit more self-awareness, to have a little bit more of their, you know, wits about them when they're sitting back. If you're going to rip one at the dinner table with your plus size friend sitting across from you, maybe before you start ripping in on yourself about how you're so fat and ugly, think about the fact that you have a plus size person sitting across from you at the table. And if you are so fat and hideous and horrible and disgusting, what does that make this person that is actually a plus size person that is actually a fat person sitting across from you? Okay, so let's think. Let's use our brains for one quick second (sighs) because we're just sincerely way too old for this and it's 2024 and we just need to get with it at this point, okay? Because you've had more than enough time to educate yourself on why that's a fucking 
load of bullshit, which is also why I have a hard time having empathy for people that are still speaking like that in 2024, because I'm like, listen, you've had access to the information on how to be better for years now. Okay. This conversation has been a conversation for years and years and years and years and years at this point. You have access to the computer. You have access to your phone. I know that you've seen this shit. This conversation is not new to you. Like you have had time and you have had the resources to be better and you're choosing not to. And it's at the expense of your plus size friends. So let's think about it. Let's think about it because your plus size friends need you to be better and to be more conscious of the language that you're using. Okay. Cause it's not fucking hard. And some of you look goofy. I'm so sorry that your friends are speaking like this in front of you. That is absolutely uncalled for and they need to be checked. And I'm so sorry that you are probably going to have to be the one to do that because that sucks. And they should absolutely just know better at this point at their grown age. 100% absolutely. Now these sound like people that you really love, that you really care for, that you believe in the goodness of. So if you are ready to stand behind the fact that these are good people, these are good friends and you're happy to have them in your life, then I think you should also feel confident that when you deliver this call out to them, that is going to be, you know, handled and received in an appropriate way. If they really are such amazing friends and such incredible people, then I don't think you have to worry about the delivery because it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a problem. Unfortunately, it often does fall on the shoulders of plus size people to educate straight size people on how their words and actions, um, negatively impact the plus size people in their lives. It sucks that that is the truth. Okay, Mango. <laughs> if I were you, I would bring it up before it happens again, because at least if it were me, if it happened again in front of me and I was in my head trying to, you know, work up the courage to bring this conversation topic up, I might accidentally get angrier than I intend to if I'm reacting to it happening in the moment. I think my delivery would probably be better um, and received better if I brought it up outside of a moment where it's happening. Um, I'm assuming that you have, if these are your best friends, you've probably expressed to them in the past some, you know, information on your own body image journey, I'm assuming. So, this is also where it gets like weird to me because I'm like, I just don't understand how like close friends could say things like that and not think about you. Um, it is off putting to me. It is a red flag to me. Um, ultimately, I believe this is a necessary conversation that you need to have with your friends because how they react should, you know, speak worlds to you, should speak volumes to you. These are your close friends. They should care about you know, making sure that they're not being an asshole to you for no reason, especially if it's accidental. Um, but I would bring it up out of a moment where it's happening just to make sure that, um, things don't get more heated than they have to. Cause that's exactly what would happen if I were you <laughs> be vulnerable, tell them exactly how it makes you feel and be really clear in like, why it is that the language they're using is harmful and why you need it to stop not only just around you but in general because to be honest with you I don't want to be friends with someone who's fat phobic when I'm not around you know like I, I don't want to be friends with someone who is only kind to fat people when I'm in the room and listening I need you know people in my life that are fucking with the shit and get it and are not gonna you know be using harmful language and using fat as a bad word in the year 2024 let's not be fucking lame, shall we? <laughs> so anyways, I am so with you. I empathize with how you're feeling completely. Um, I think you're just going to have to be vulnerable. Tell them exactly what you told me. Open up about how you're feeling, how hearing them say what they're saying makes you feel, why it is that it's harmful. And, um, you know, just be be open with them in that way and hopefully if they are the friends that you think they are if they really are bestie material they will react um you know with open ears and concern because your friends should damn sure not want to be making you feel shittier about yourself um, or contributing to fat phobia as your friend okay but i'm sorry it's happening in the first place because really we are too fucking old for that shit 
Hi, Maddie. I recently learned or finally admitted to myself that I have an anxious attachment style. It makes me feel ashamed because I feel like in society, it's much cooler to be avoidant and to be the person that is more independent, not so focused on relationships. I'm the opposite. I always wonder about everyone else and what I can do for them, and I just get very needy. The last person I fell in love with was avoidant, which only increased my anxiety. I think you mentioned before that you healed your anxious attachment. How did you do that? Did you have do you have any tips? Love your videos and podcast. I forget where I read this. I want to say it's in Attached, which if you haven't read, I think you should absolutely read it. Um, Attached is a book on attachment style. And um, I feel like I learned a lot about my own attachment style and how to become more secure through reading that book. But I feel like I read in that book, if I'm not mistaken, but I feel like I read somewhere that it's usually easier to go from anxious to secure than it is to go from avoidant to secure. I think they say that people that are anxiously attached can often become secure in the right partnerships can become more secure with a secure partner and avoidant doesn't always become more secure with a secure partner because they are avoidant anxiously attached people really just need to be with a secure communicator they need to be with someone that makes them feel secure and then they have an easier time becoming more secure um, through that like modeled behavior and having someone that makes it easier for them to you know manage their anxieties and worries being with someone that doesn't trigger you and that's why so often anxiously attached people end up with avoidantly attached people um, and that's why it doesn't work right <laughs> but I do think that the path to becoming securely attached is easier as an anxiously attached person going to a securely attached person so that's something and honestly I think the number one thing that helped me move towards being more secure and away from being anxious was getting good at identifying when um someone's communication style was not compatible with mine I think so often in my dating life I was seeing people or interested in people that always kept me like at arm's length and that really you know heightened my anxiety I felt like I never had a clear picture on how they felt about me I felt like I never knew where we stood um there was no part of our dynamic that made me feel at ease ever I feel like I was constantly worried and like sending a text and you know waiting an hour felt like oh god is there something wrong I was always waiting for the other shoe to drop because I was never around people that um seemed to be as invested as I was and were never as clear in their communication as I was um and I think I blamed myself for that for a long time like when I would like when other people would not be clear with their intentions or would maybe be a little shady with their intentions I assumed that it was me that wanted too much that was asking for too much I've talked about my like too muchness on the podcast so much because for so long that really is what I put it on like I blamed everything on myself and that I was asking for much I was doing too much like I was overwhelming when really I was just looking for somebody to like match me and to take enough interest in me um so that I was able to learn what it was like to feel more secure <laughs> and I think with the most recent person that I had feelings for they were really the first person ever that didn't trigger my anxious attachment and I think one of the major reasons why they didn't trigger my anxious attachment is because they were such a fantastic communicator even when we weren't on the same page at the end of it all we were not on the same page but like throughout our entire you know friendship time being close to each other I always felt like I understood him and that he understood me and I felt really cared for by him I never doubted that he cared for me and that I was important to him I always felt like I knew where I stood with him and I feel like we had a lot of very vulnerable and open conversations with each other. And um, even when we were in different places, I never felt like um, far away from him, if that makes sense. I don't know. I, I, I think he was just um, a very kind, very communicative person and shit happens. 
And sometimes you're just not on the same page with people. You're in different eras of life. You need different things and that's fine. But I think honestly it was kind of great for me to see how like even when something doesn't work out, you can leave feeling like you benefited so greatly from knowing them. And I I do feel that way about him. I, I Honestly, I feel like knowing him healed a huge part of my heart in that way because he really was the first person that didn't trigger my anxiousness. And he was the first person that made me feel more secure. And I think a lot of that had to do with the internal work that I did before I met him. Um, but a lot of it had to do with him too. I really do think a big part of it for me was getting good at identifying like when someone is just like objectively not a good match for me, when someone's communication style is not compatible with mine, um, getting good at communicating what I want, feeling confident in what I want, um, you know, combating the like fear of being too much inside my brain that for so long made me feel um, guilty for asking for what I wanted in relationships, for seeking that intimacy and closeness. There was a part of me that always felt like I was a burden to the people that I was dating. And, um, I know now that that was not the truth and that we were on completely different planets in terms of not only what we wanted, but what we were capable of. I often found myself dating people that made me feel worse, dating people that made me feel so anxious, but I blamed myself for that I blamed myself for being too needy and um you know I want too much communication and I want someone to like be excited to be around me and to invest time in our conversations and like really make me feel loved oh my god I'm such a burden for that like I was never a burden for that and it was never needy of me it was that I was in a mismatched relationship I was dating people that could not meet me at the level that I was at. They were not meeting me in the communication department, in the intimacy department, in the vulnerability department. And I was judging myself for that instead of realizing that we weren't a match. And I feel like as I got better at identifying when someone is just not a match for me, it became a lot easier for me to become secure because it's not about me. You know what I mean? I'm not taking it personally when someone's not a match with me. We're just not a match versus me not being good enough to, you know, warrant higher communication or to warrant more vulnerability, to warrant that kind of closeness. Instead of me taking it as a personal attack and letting it make me anxious, it became a thing of me being like, well, actually this isn't what I want and you aren't what I want and we are just not compatible. And when I got better at identifying that and accepting that and when I got more confident about what I wanted and what I brought to the table and I felt more confident walking away from things that were not what I wanted, I became a much secure version of myself. And I think that that paired with my most recent experience in having an all-consuming crush, <laughs> I think that experience being so positive and being with someone that like I don't know, really helped me finish out the transition into being secure that it had already started on my own. Like having that experience was also really great. And I felt very much at peace and just happy the whole time that um, he was in my life. And um, I guess I got to switch topics now. (laughs) Oh my goodness. Uh, Mango is being so cutie right now i gotta give her some solo mommy time little pockets of it throughout the day because um the babies are crazy they're still here but i put them in the other room while i do the podcast so mango could have some alone time with me i'm glad we got it i'm glad she came here and cuddled and that was so sweet now my neck fucking hurts (laughs) from being bent through that whole segment oh baby what a day we have had it is 6.30 p.m. on Friday, September 27th. I'm about to finish this glass of wine, edit this entire podcast, cue it to go live tomorrow, which is today when you're listening to this. Um, and then I'm going to have a good fucking weekend. I'm planning on digitizing my entire wardrobe this weekend, which is going to be such a beast, but I'm quite excited to do it. It's going to be a lot of fun just listening to a podcast, listening to some music, digitizing my closet, doing some organizing. I think it's going to be greatly satisfying to me. 
I love data. Oh, it's going to be so awesome once I can track my like cost per wear, the whole value of my wardrobe, see what pieces I'm neglecting very clearly and also style outfits digitally. Oh, it's going to be awesome. So anyways, that's what I'm up to when you're listening to this podcast. I'm going to make a video documenting that process over on my YouTube channel. So um, stay tuned for that. And um, apologies for the inconsistency um, in posting schedule recently with the podcast. Life has been cuckoo crazy bonks. I'm starting now to get my footing back again. So sorry for having a crazy posting day (laughs) and posting sort of whenever I want to uh, over the past like two months. Um, I think next week I should be on top of my shit again. So, um, we'll go back to normal Friday posting for the podcast and, um, hopefully we'll stay that way through the end of the year. So thank you guys so much. I love you so much and I will see you next week. Goodbye. Goodbye.